Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our latest Medicine for Members event. Uh, my name is Jay Mehta, and I'm a Royal Free London elected staff governor and a GP trainee. Um, for those of you who are new to our Medicine for Members events, um, they are organised and chaired by our Council of Governors. Um, our Medicine for Members events focus on topics that we know are important to you. So they give members the opportunity to hear more about services at Royal Free, Barnet and Chase Farm Hospitals. And our topic tonight is developing a deeper understanding of type 1 diabetes now and for future generations. So approximately 400,000 people are currently living with type 1 diabetes in the UK and the number of new diagnoses is increasing by approximately 4% each year. And this event will help showcase a joint work of the diabetes specialist clinical teams and researchers to help develop a better understanding of the changes within the body that accompanies the disease. Um, we'll also share details about a new national screening program for children who may be at risk of developing type 1 diabetes in the future. So I'm very excited to let you know we will be joined by Dr Miranda Rosenthal, diabetes consultant at Royal Free Hospital, Professor Lucy Walker, Chair in Immune Regulation at the Institute of Immunity and Transplantation, and Professor Parth Narendran, Professor of Diabetes Medicine at the Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy. So before I hand you over to our presenters, there are just a few housekeeping points that I need to make you aware of. Um, for the event to run smoothly, uh, attendees are all set up to view only. That means that your cameras have been disabled and you have been put on mute. Um, if any of you experience any connection problems, um, there will be a recording of the meeting and a link to that recording will be sent out via email to all members after the event. Um, there will be a Q&A session after our speakers have given their presentations. Um, we have had several questions submitted in advance, but please do ask any questions you may have through the Q&A chat function in your Microsoft Teams screen. Uh, we will do our best to answer all questions asked, and if your question is not answered, please send it to the membership email address, and we will let you know how to do this later in the session. If you would like to contact the Council of Governors with any queries, concerns or comments, uh, please do so via the Governor email address, which is on the screen now. Uh, I very much hope you enjoy the event tonight and I will hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Miranda Rosenthal. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Miranda Rosenthal. I'm a diabetes consultant at the Royal Free and I am the lead for specialist services for patients with type 1 diabetes and clinical lead for islet transplantation. Um, I'm really, really excited to be invited to come and speak today about really what is a sea change in the way that we think about type 1 diabetes and the type of therapies that are available for type 1 diabetes. Uh, next slide, please. So first of all, I'd like to think a bit about what is type 1 diabetes. So when we talk about diabetes, we're talking about a group of conditions that are really uh, classified by the fact that they all cause glucose levels in the blood to be higher than they should. The reasons for this can be quite different though, and there's type 1, there's type 2, and there's several other forms of diabetes, but tonight we're going to be talking principally about type 1 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is a condition where the blood glucose levels are too high because your body cannot make a hormone called insulin. The body attacks the cells in the pancreas that make insulin. Insulin allows the glucose in our blood to enter our cells and fuel our bodies. When you have type 1 diabetes, your body still breaks down the carbohydrate from food and drink and turns it into glucose. But when the glucose goes into the bloodstream, there's no insulin to allow it to go into the body's cells. More and more glucose then builds up in your bloodstream, leading to high glucose levels. Now, this is different from type 2 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, there is often quite enough insulin, but the insulin doesn't work properly. So as I said tonight, the focus of our, uh, of our discussions and conversations is around type 1 diabetes, where there is a lack of insulin due to destruction of the pancreas cells that produce it. Next slide, please. So insulin was discovered in 1921 by Banting and Best and McLeod. And a year later, it was given as a treatment to patient JL, who survived what would have been a, a, a sure death at that point, and survived for another 14 years. What also happened, which is also quite interesting in the discovery of insulin, is the patent for insulin was sold to a Toronto University for 
So it was basically given because it was felt that this should be a treatment that should be available to everybody. What I find particularly interesting is what Banting said when in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize. He said that insulin is a cure is not a cure for diabetes, it's a treatment. And what's defined my career and most of the career of patient people working with diabetes is how to manage insulin for people with type 1 diabetes, how to make sure that the glucose levels are in target so that people don't develop complications, but also that the blood glucose levels don't go too low, causing hypoglycemia. And really, the, my entire career has been defined about trying to find ways to give insulin in an effective manner to reach the goal of getting patients to have control that's in target, because we know that if the, the levels are kept in the target range, people don't develop the long term complications of diabetes. Next slide, please. So how are we doing? At the Royal Free, this is our national audit data from 2021-22. And in our cohort, in our group of patients, we have 100, uh, 1, 000, nearly 1,500 patients across all sites. And what's very interesting is that despite our best efforts, the people who reach the blood glucose levels, which mean that they won't develop long-term complications, are uh, in, the, in the number of 43%. So despite our best efforts, this is a this is a dashboard that demonstrates all the things that we look at for people with diabetes. But looking at something called the HbA1c, which is how we understand whether diabetes control is in target or not, we're only reaching it in 43.7 percent of people. So that means that over 50 percent of people are not where they should be with their blood glucose levels, despite all of our, our high tech um, devices and input. Next slide, please. So what does it look like in north central London? So this is a dashboard looking at what diabetes control is like for people with type 1 diabetes in north central London. And the first thing to say, I should say, is actually north central London and the world free are above the national average. So we're doing well, but we're just not doing good enough. So when we look at the numbers of people who have an HbA1c over 58, it's 1,540 and there's 410 people who have an HbA1c, which is in a dangerously high zone. So this means that these people are very, very high risk of developing complications from type 1 diabetes. So it seems that the insulin that we have really isn't doing what it needs to do, and that is delivering good diabetes control and preventing people from getting long, lifelong complications. Next slide, please. A lot of you will be familiar with the technology that's available for diabetes. In fact, it's now being offered in pe for people who don't have diabetes to keep an eye on their health. And what we've noticed is with the with the implementation of a device called um, a flash sensor since 2017 in north central London, we've improved the numbers of people, the percentage of people who have diabetes that is in the range that it should be from 33 to 43 percent, which is really quite extraordinary. However, it still means that there are vast numbers of people that despite access to the technology don't have the levels where they need to be. Next slide, please. So it seems to be that we're right for a sea change in the way that we think about managing type 1 diabetes. It's time for us to start to think about preventing uh, diabetes and stopping the progression of type 1 diabetes by giving therapies that affect the actual uh, process that causes type 1 diabetes, the, the attack of the cells in the pancreas. This drug, teplizumab, um, has been licensed in the States and it delays the onset of type 1 diabetes in the relatives who are at risk of type 1 diabetes. And I won't go into it in a great amount of detail, but it's interesting that it's been considered on a fast track for the European Medicines Association as well and may well be available quite soon. And the question, is it worth it? And it is, because with these kind of drugs, it's possible that we can actually induce years of having normal blood glucose levels before the blood glucose levels start to go in the range where they start could be considered to be putting people at risk of developing complications. There's no lifetime lifestyle restrictions. There's no issues with people having to uh, take instructions and eat food in a certain way and time their insulin in a certain way to achieve the levels that they need to to keep away from getting complications. It also means that there is an opportunity to have a legacy of really good diabetes control in the first few years of your um, of your lifetime with diabetes, which we know has a big impact later on. It also means that when people are going through their adolescence, which is often a time when type 1 diabetes presents, there's an opportunity to, to protect them from having to go through taking lots of injections and using devices to manage their diabetes. It also addresses the amplified health inequalities, which are inherent in a condition which 
requires you to be able to access care, attend appointments and use the devices adequately. Next slide, please. And so I just want to introduce for my final slide the strategy, Royal Free Strategy for Research in Type 1 Diabetes. We want to stop people from developing further development of type 1 diabetes, which means that we want to be able to recruit people into commercial immunotherapy studies to see what works and stop the progression of the condition and preserve the pancreas function. We want to continue our support of investigator-led research. We also want to prevent, we want to increase the number of people who are screened for type 1 diabetes so those at risk can be offered disease modifying therapies to prevent them from getting type 1 diabetes in the first place. And finally, to cure, we want to increase the number of people offered beta cell replacement to cure type 1 diabetes. Next slide. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, um, Professor Lucy Walker, who'll talk in more detail about immune therapies for type 1 diabetes. Thank you very much. Just share my screen. So I'm Professor Lucy Walker and I run a research group focused on understanding how type 1 diabetes develops and devising new immunotherapies to treat it. And many of you may know that type 1 diabetes occurs because the immune system attacks and destroys the cells that make insulin in the pancreas. Within the pancreas, there are these little clusters of cells called islets of Langerhans, each one about the size of a grain of salt. The islets have a number of different cell types in them, but it's these orange cells here in the picture, the beta cells, that are the ones that make insulin. And it's these cells that are specifically targeted by the immune system in type 1 diabetes. And as you've just heard, our current treatment for type 1 diabetes is essentially to put back the insulin that the body can't make by injection. And this was made possible by the discovery of insulin in 1921. And as you've heard this um, prior to this, type 1 diabetes was a fatal disease. So um, insulin has really been life changing, but it's not a cure. It doesn't tackle the root cause of the problem. If we want to stop the immune system from destroying the insulin producing cells, we actually need research to understand this immune response. Which immune cells are involved? Which molecules are they using? How could we interrupt this? And this is exactly the kind of research that we're doing here at the Royal Free. And we're incredibly fortunate to have a beautiful new research building to do it in. This is the PEARS building, which was supported by a joint initiative between UCL, the Royal Free Hospital and the Royal Free Charity. And it's home to the Institute of Immunity and Transplantation, where my research team is based. And this is where we spend our days studying uh, the immune system. And we do this in a lot of different ways. One of the things that we do is to take blood samples from people with type 1 diabetes and we purify out the components of the blood by layering it onto this clear fluid, putting the tube in a centrifuge and spinning it. And this is how the tube looks at the end. And you might just be able to see that between this yellow fluid on the top and the clear fluid here, there's sort of a fuzzy white line. And that line is your white blood cells. And these are the cells of your immune system. And there's a, an immune cell type that we're particularly interested in called the T cell. You may have heard T cells talked about in the context of the COVID pandemic. These are important immune cells for fighting infection. But unfortunately, some of the time they also can attack your own body. And this is what happens in autoimmune conditions like type 1 diabetes. 
So we purify the T cells from the blood samples and we can analyze them under the microscope. These blue cells that you can see here, these are T cells. We can also use a technique called flow cytometry. Here we take the cells and tag them with different colors and they get sucked up into this blue machine here and uh, they flow through a laser beam and we can analyze thousands of cells per second this way and get huge amounts of information from them. So what sort of thing have we learned from this research? Well, one of the things we've been doing is trying to understand how immunotherapies that are being tested are affecting different immune populations. So um, there's an immunotherapy that was tested in people with type 1 diabetes and showed some benefit, but didn't work quite as well as we expected. And so we've been trying to understand why. We've taken uh, blood samples from people who participated in this clinical trial and performed flow cytometry, the technique I was just telling you about, that, that blue machine. We gained lots of information from this and because there's a lot of data, we've used machine learning techniques to analyze it. These are powerful computer based approaches. And we found that the therapy decreased a population of cells that we think is involved in causing type 1 diabetes. And I'm just calling these the dangerous T cells here. If we looked in people two years after receiving this therapy, they have a lower percentage of these dangerous T cells than before they took the therapy. So this is a good thing. But what we also found is that the therapy decreased a population of T cells called regulatory T cells. Now these are cells that we know protect from type 1 diabetes and other autoimmune conditions. So it's actually not ideal that the therapy is decreasing these cells. So in this particular clinical trial, the immunotherapy was decreasing the protective immune cells as well as the dangerous ones. Over the last six years or so, my team has been developing a new immunotherapy approach that decreases the dangerous T cells, but spares the regulatory T cells. And there's a little bit of data uh, over on the left hand side of the slide where you can see the therapy that was trialed uh, led to a reduction in the frequency of these regulatory T cells, but our new immunotherapy approach does not. So we think that this might be a powerful new way to interrupt the immune response that causes type 1 diabetes. Our new immunotherapy approach is still at a very early stage of development. There's a lot more work that we need to do to see uh, whether this is going to be useful. But the good news is there are new therapies that target T cells already um, showing some success and already starting to arrive in the clinic. And in fact, uh, the first ever immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes was approved by the FDA just at the end of last year. There was a, a very nice review of this in the scientific journal Nature a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is Michaela here, who was one of the first recipients of this drug uh, in, in America. And the treatment was given to people who were at high risk of developing type 1 diabetes, and we have good markers in the blood for that. And it delayed the development of diabetes by an average of three years. So I think there's really some quite significant progress in the field in terms of understanding the immune response that causes type 1 diabetes and um, finding ways to interrupt this process. But there are some significant challenges still remaining. We do need better immunotherapies. We need to delay diabetes for longer than just this three years, um, ideally stop it altogether. And now we have 
therapies coming through that can potentially delay the development of diabetes in people who are at risk. We need systems to identify people at risk so that when these therapies get approved in the UK, these individuals will be able to benefit from them. And this is going to be uh, talked a little bit more about uh, in the next presentation. So I will end by acknowledging my fantastic research team and uh, my funders, and I will pass to Professor Parth Narendran for the next presentation. I hope people can hear me and see my screen. But a yes. Yeah, right. Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. So um, thank you for the invite to, to speak. So um, I'm pa Path Narendran, I'm based at the University of Birmingham, but also with an affiliation um, to University College London. <clears throat> so what are the benefits of screening? Let's have a look. So the benefits of screening are that we can identify people early and offer them follow up and education and support leading up to the diagnosis with type 1 diabetes. We can start treatment earlier and the studies that show that diabetes control is um, uh, much better for uh, at least five years after diagnosis um, if you're diagnosed in screening. Uh, we can prevent diabetic ketoacidosis. So currently about a quarter of our children who are diagnosed with diabetes are, are diagnosed as an emergency as diabetic ketoacidosis. And we can reduce that to less than 5% if they're in a screening program. And then the last thing is this agent topluzumab that both Miranda and Lucy mentioned, um, which is um, very effective um, at reducing, uh, at slowing the progression to type 1 diabetes. And along with topluzumab are lots of other agents uh, which are in development, uh, which may well go through licensing. So we're, we're entering an, an, a, re, uh, a time where we can potentially provide a cocktail of therapies we can, which can delay type 1 diabetes for longer and longer and longer. And that's including the therapies that, um, uh, that Lucy also is, uh, is trying to develop. The natural history of type 1 diabetes. So we're, people with type 1 diabetes are born with a genetic risk and we know what some of this genetic risk is. Then there's an immune activation and we're still not really sure what that is. But once that happens, these markers of immunity arise and we can measure these in the blood fairly simply uh, as antibodies. And if there are two or more antibodies, then we know that at some stage over the next few years or even out to 15 years, that's a that that person is going to get type 1 diabetes. And then we can stratify how, how close they are to getting type 1 diabetes by giving them a sugar drink test or an oral glucose tolerance test. During that test, if their blood glucose is normal, then we can say, look, your, your rates of progression to type 1 uh, diabetes and needing insulin is about 50% over five years and about 75% over 10 years. If they, however, have a slightly abnormal glucose, when we can say, well, you're a little bit closer to, to developing type 1 diabetes. And some people actually will have diabetes, but are still not aware of it. And this is classically where people are diagnosed now. So, um, but what we're actually saying is that at this stage, we can be confident they're getting type 1 diabetes and we should be calling this pre-symptomatic type 1 diabetes um, and allow people to prepare uh, for, for, for life uh, with diabetes. This is a drug that both Lucy and Miranda have mentioned. So this is, these are people who entered the clinical trial of teplizumab. Um, and here are the, and they were randomized either into receiving placebo or teplizumab. Um, here are the proportion that are free of type 1 diabetes, so 100%. Um, and followed up for one, two, three, four, five years. Those who got the placebo gradually fell off. And you can see that as time went on over five years, about 20% um, were diabetes free, but 80% had developed diabetes. And there was half that rate in people who received teplizumab. And when 
when many of us saw this study first came out in the summer uh, of 2019, we realized that the field of type 1 diabetes had really changed. You know, for the first time, we'd found something really effective that could um, change the course of disease. And of course, you know, this sort of therapy is now routine in many, many other autoimmune conditions. There are immunotherapies that are given to people at risk of, um, you know, who've got rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, which are modifying the course of disease. And for the first time, we've got something in type 1 diabetes. And we knew this was, you know, a really watershed moment. Just to say that <clears throat> the drug is very easy to give. So it's a daily infusion for two weeks. Um, so you get an injection every day for two weeks and then that's it for the next five years. That's all they got. So very tolerable treatment and the side effects also look very acceptable and minimal. So, so what is the ELSA study? So ELSA stands for Early Surveillance for Autoimmune Diabetes. It is a study where we're trying to screen children between the age of three and 13 um, to explore their chances of getting type 1 diabetes. Um, so um, we're aiming to recruit 20,000 children um, between the age of three and 13 across all four nations, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, and explore important issues such as acceptability and feasibility. So this, we see this as a prelude potentially to a screening program uh, that could be set up across the country for type 1 diabetes so that we can offer them these therapies as they become licensed, but also offer them uh, participation in clinical trials and also uh, the benefits, the other benefits of screening, which I mentioned earlier. Primarily, we're, we're testing acceptability and feasibility. So do people want to come into a screening program and enter their children into a screening program? And is it feasible? Um, you know, do they, can we actually recruit uh, to a study and what are the best routes of recruitment? It received widespread publicity, so it was launched at the end of last year on World Diabetes Day, 14th of November, which is um, the birthday of Banting, which is one of the um, one of four people who helped discover insulin. And you've seen a photo of him previously uh, on the, this evening. So on World Diabetes Day, um, the study was launched uh, very widely and proved to be incredibly popular. And we recruited a thousand families on the very first day largely due to the publicity from, um, uh, from Diabetes UK and JDRF who are funding the study. The routes of recruitment we're looking at are home testing primarily. So we've rec recruited over 4,000 children now for home testing. Um, we'd also like to explore if we can recruit through schools. So uh, can we can we enroll and approach children in, in schools to, to participate and to screen? But also, can we do it through GP practices and can we piggyback on a, on contact points that are currently established, such as the vaccine program? So children currently go for an MMR vaccine um, at the age between the age of three and four. Can we use that as an opportunity to screen for type one diabetes? So we're trying to explore the, these three um, routes of recruitment. It's a very simple test, so it's a finger prick test. Um, and five drops of blood, which are put on this blotting paper, which are then posted back um, to the University of Birmingham. And then the antibodies are measured on here and then the families are informed of their risk. And we do this at home um, or fa family members can do it at home on their children, but we could also do this uh, at schools and at GP practices. Once the dried blood spot is done, the majority of these will be negative. So about 99% will be negative. But for those that are positive, we need to do a confirmatory venous test. And that's usually done in a hospital. So this can be done in a, a home or a school. This is done in a, uh, uh, in a hospital. And then if that's confirmed positive, then we do the oral glucose tolerance test that we mentioned earlier um, to stage how close they, they are to diabetes. Um, education is provided so people know exactly what this um, what this involves, what it means, what are their options. Uh, we do some important qualitative work. So, um, you know, how was the study for you? Is there any way we can improve it? Um, we also um, look at the psychological impact. So we offer uh, a psychologist if people are finding this anxious 
And certainly studies from other countries where there have been screening programs suggest that uh, there is, of course, anxiety at the time that the diagnosis is given. But over the next year, this, this gradually settles and people are not as anxious as they would be if they were diagnosed as an emergency, uh, as you can imagine. Following that, then we, off, we offer them a monitoring program uh, and support. Um, of course, if they have type 1 diabetes, they initiate it on insulin and that would happen right here rather than waiting for here and participation in clinical trials. So the first step of this is the dried blood spot, which I mentioned earlier. There are 20 hospitals dotted around the country uh, where the confirmatory tests are done. Here is all free uh, in Birmingham, uh, but we have hospitals set up across uh, Wales, Scotland, as well as Northern Ireland. These are the numbers that we've recruited. So we started uh, really in November and our target is a thousand patients a month and we're really we are sort of hitting that. There was that initial surge. So these are the number of people who consented uh, in the first month and gradually it's it's not as it's not as high now, but we are hitting on average a thousand a month. Um, these are the number of kits that have been sent out. We just couldn't keep up with it's demand when the initial consent uh, consents flooded in, but we've caught up now. Largely all the kits have been sent out and these are the numbers that have been analysed, sent back and analysed. So far we found two children of the 1300 that have been, um, or 1400 that have been analysed, two have been confirmed positive and to be at risk and both of those are at stage one. So they've been offered education, support um, and long term monitoring. So so that's the ELSA study is in a nutshell. If it's opening in, um, in North London and has been available in North London for a while, but we're actually now going to be rolling it out through schools locally uh, as well as GP practices um, uh, in, in North London. For people who are, who are watching this this evening, um, you can scan this QR code and that should take you to the study website for those of you who are interested in participating. Um, and we, you can order a kit to um, to take part in the study. Or alternatively, just go onto this website and um, register your interest there and a kit will be posted out to you. As you can imagine, lots of people in, involved in this um, <clears throat> Just need to mention Lauren Quinn, who's our research fellow on this, um, Tim Barrett, who's Professor of Pediatrics, um, Alex Richter, Professor of Immunology, who helped develop the dry blood spot antibody assay. Um, a lot of support from the clinical research networks, both in the Midlands as well as nationally. Um, and of course, colleagues that they're all free, um, pedi pediatric colleagues and CRN colleagues that they're all free are helping deliver on the study. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, my reflections as well, the slides loading. So um, brilliant. Uh, I think in the course of a half hour, we've gone from history to pathophysiology to public health and screening to clinical research and lab research, um, all for a disease which we know has a, um, a high morbidity and a high, very high impact on patients and where there's um, a huge amount of excitement and enthusiasm about the future. So thank you very much. Um, let's uh, move on to the questions and answers. So just as a reminder, um, you can submit your questions in the Q&A panel on Microsoft Teams. Uh, we do have a few questions in advance, which we'll start with. So moving straight through, number one, what foods sh should people with type 1 diabetes avoid and why? And I'm going to come to Dr. Rosenthal to answer this one. Thanks very much. It's it's an interesting question because I think it, it's probably referring to a few ideas around diabetes. So type 1 diabetes isn't something that we associate with eating foods that are considered to be not healthy or eating too much. It's basically so essentially the, the message is when you have type 1 diabetes is a healthy, healthy eating message. So a low fat uh, kind of um, non processed type of food. Um, and it's actually really important that people try to uh, 
adopt an approach which means that they can incorporate it into their normal lives with their families and living their lives without making extraordinary efforts to alter what they're eating. Um, this question may be getting at, there has been some um, evidence, and so, well, not some evidence, but some investigations which have looked to see whether food, children exposed to certain foods develop type 1 diabetes. Um, and again, intervention studies have not been particularly impressive in that regard. So I think really food and type 1 diabetes, it's about personal choice being informed by healthy living messages. What we do do for, with people with type 1 diabetes, is we do a lot of work on carbohydrate counting, which again is giving people the skills so that they know how much insulin to take with carbohydrate. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, next question we have is, is type 1 diabetes a genetic disease that can be passed on to your children? Uh, I think Professor Walker, over to you for this one, please. Thank you. Yes, so there is a genetic component to type 1 diabetes development. If you have a relative with type 1 diabetes, you're about 15 times more likely to develop it than otherwise. And we know a little bit about the, the genes that are involved, many of them uh, control the behaviour of T cells, the immune cells that I was, I was talking about earlier. But actually one of the things that many people don't know is over 85% of people with type 1 diabetes don't have a family history of it. So most people will be getting it without having had uh, a relative with it. And this is why for the screening programmes uh, like Path was talking about earlier, you can't just um, go to relatives of people with type 1 diabetes, you have to go out into the, the broader population because if you just go to relatives, you're actually going to miss most of the people uh, who will end up getting diagnosed. Great, thank you very much. And uh, the next question we have, why is the number of people diagnosed with type 1 diabetes increasing? and what can be done slash is being done to reduce this. I know we've alluded to the answer a little bit already, but uh, Professor Narendran, I wonder if I can go over to you for this one. Yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, rates are going up, particularly in the under fives. That's where we have the strongest uh, data. Um, so that bit is easy. The, the bit about why it's going up is still really not clear. So because it's going up at such a quick rate, it can't be a genetic cause because the genes are not going to change that quickly. So it has to be an environmental cause. And as Lucy alluded to, you can have genes for high risk for diabetes, but not get type 1 diabetes. So there is a strong environmental contribution to this. Um, and we're still exploring what these might be. Could these be viruses? Um, could this be something in the in diet? Uh, so that it still isn't clear. There's an, always an interesting thing about COVID. So I don't know what happened in the raw free, but certainly in Birmingham around the latter end of COVID, we had lots of new diagnoses of type one diabetes. So um, I don't. Uh, so, so and I know there's lots of research going on to see if COVID has has brought has precipitated this. But the other thing to note is that. Um, Sometimes if people are hanging around in stage one or stage two with pre-diabetes and they get an insult that means if they get an infection or something that means they need more insulin to control their glucose and that insulin reserve isn't there, then the glucose levels are going to go up and it unmasks that beta cell deficiency. So it may be that infections such as COVID unmask a beta cell deficiency, but um, as the infection goes away, the glucose level comes back down again. So it might unmask that people are going to get type 1 diabetes anyway. So some people have called it the spring harvest. Are we getting an early harvest of, of, of type 1s? And there's some evidence from some of the European countries that we did have a spring harvest. So there was an early, early, early year presentation, but as the years have gone on, the numbers have come down a little bit. So I've given quite a few answers there, but essentially we don't really know the we don't really know the answer, an area of really active research um, and its environmental factors that we're looking at. Great, thank you very much. And um, that phrase spring harvest isn't one I've heard before, so I'll remember that, thank you. Um, the next question we had, uh, 
suits. So can type 1 diabetes develop later in life or is it predominantly diagnosed during childhood? Um, so I think uh, to start with uh, Professor Narendran and I think maybe Dr. Rosenthal perhaps might chip in a little as well. Yeah, so um, uh, it can uh, it present at any age. Uh, Miranda, I'm sure, I mean, I, we've diagnosed it in the 80s. Uh, and uh, Theresa May, my favourite story is Theresa May was diagnosed with diabetes in her 40s. They mistook it for type 2 diabetes for a couple of years before they realised she had type 1. So it can be really challenging to tell the difference. Um, and there's some evidence actually of the incidence doesn't change at all between childhood and adulthood. It's exactly the same. It's just that there's a lot more type 2 diabetes as we get older, and that, so therefore type 1 gets lost a little bit in, in that. And Miranda, if you want to add to that. Yes, I mean, I tend to uh, stick with the numbers that 50% of di type 1 diabetes is, is diagnosed in adulthood. And I think what we now have is the opportunity to test antibodies fairly, fairly easily and see peptide, which is a way of measuring pancreatic reserve. And by looking at those, those, those results, there is a way of being able to understand whether or not somebody has type 1 diabetes or not. But also it, it can be quite difficult to make that diagnosis um, and uh, you know even within specialist hands you know sometimes we, we have to say to people I'm going to say you have diabetes unspecified because I actually don't quite know yet and we have to wait and see what happens I suppose what we're hoping over time is that uh, we'll be able to really understand who has got early type 1 or pre preclinical type 1 so that we can offer therapies to to interfere with the natural history Fantastic, thank you very much. And moving on, so um, there is a question, is the risk of type 1 diabetes increased if the patient has one or more autoimmune diseases slash conditions? Um, Professor Walker, I wonder if I can bring this over to you. Yes. That's right. Um, so the answer is yes. If you have one autoimmune condition, you are more likely to have um, an additional autoimmune condition. And in fact, up to a third of people who have some sort of autoimmune disease have more than one. And one of the reasons we think this might be is that the, the basic immune mechanisms that control your immune system and keep it behaving properly most of the time, if these have um, if these change in some way and your immune regulation gets a little bit weakened, then you can be susceptible to not just one autoimmune attack just in your pancreas, say, but, but also additional um, tissues can be targeted by that sort of dysregulated immune response. And there's a lot of interest now in trying to um, understand the similarities between different autoimmune diseases, understand if there are common immune mechanisms that can help us to actually devise common treatments that will work not just in one autoimmune disease but in several uh, autoimmune conditions and this is a really active area of research at the moment. Fantastic, thank you. And moving on to the next question, um, what is the advice to parents, uh, if any, to spot early signs of diabetes in young children? Um, would anyone like to volunteer to answer can that I one? Take, I can take that one. I mean, Brilliant. I'm not Thank a paediatrician. I suppose that's the first important thing to say. Um, but I suppose, you know, the symptoms that what um, Parth has been talking about is sort of screening before people have got any symptoms. And what we're talking about is noticing whether or not your child is developing symptoms of type 1 diabetes. And I think that what most parents and people with living with diabetes talk about is often they find that they they, they notice their child's losing weight, um, getting up at night, passing a lot of urine, going more frequently, uh, feeling tired. I think with any of those symptoms, the advice would be to really get advice and get checked as soon as possible and to not let things um, go. So, you know, the next working day, um, call the GP and ask for a check. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. And a question that I'm going to jump to because it follows on quite nicely is, um, are we at all using AI or digital, I'm assuming digital innovation to preempt early signs of diabetes so that it can be controlled and stopped from, from that progression into type 1 diabetes? Uh, again, uh, any volunteers? Sure. Yeah, so I, yeah. Oh, I think you go. Yeah. <laughs> I could take that. So, so um, go ahead. Um, uh, it's it's we know from work some really nice work from um, uh, from colleagues in Wales that at attendance at GP practices in the year before a child is diagnosed is increased and it's often non-specific things but parents pick up that some things are quite right and they go to the GP um, so so that sort of thing is there but it's still non-specific so um, which is why I think a screening program is it really been the only effective way to reduce the presentation in, in diabetic ketoacidosis. So there's been a number of attempts really to sort of uh, raise awareness and Diabetes UK are doing a great job now with the 40s that Miranda mentioned um, to try and increase awareness of diabetes and uh, monitor for that. But in terms of reducing DK, if you look internationally, there are not many um, efforts that have been effective and sustained other than screening programs for reducing DK risk. Um, so that's my screening program there. In terms of AI, I'm not aware of any. I don't know if, if others are, but certainly looking at GP um, records and seeing that higher attendance is there. But I guess that might be there for other conditions as well. We can't, you know, people, parents are very good at picking up when children are not well and there might be other conditions that they go for. So that's all I'm aware in terms of digital um, uh, you know, um, access. Fantastic, thank you. Professor Walker, did you want to come in on that one as well? Yes, I can just add that we have really good markers in the blood that tell you whether you're at risk of developing type 1 diabetes. These are antibodies. Um, and again, you may have heard people talk about antibodies in the context of COVID. If somebody's got um, antibodies to the virus that causes COVID in their blood, you know that they've been exposed to the virus or exposed to a vaccination. And it's the same um, with, the, with the pancreas. You know that the immune system has been sort of primed and started to become activated against the pancreas when you can see antibodies against parts of the pancreas in someone's blood. And um, so these are these are really robust markers. And we know, in fact, that 95 percent of people who are going to develop diabetes by their teens will have these autoantibodies by the age of five. So we have excellent biological markers. The, the logistical challenge is actually getting blood samples from people in order to screen for these. And again, this is where uh, PATH's screening program and the blood spots analysis comes in. Fantastic, thank you so much. And um, moving on to the next question, uh, what are the healthy life choices one should make if their HbA1c levels are high? Um, I can see Dr. Rosenthal leaning forward. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. So I think that this is probably more of, might be more of a question about type 2 diabetes um, because uh, the, the HbA1c, which is a, a number which equates and, and relates to how high the levels of glucose are in the blood, um, are dictated to um, by what you eat. But in type 1 diabetes, it's about what you eat, what how you how you balance what you've eaten in terms of carbohydrate with how much insulin you've taken. So really, this isn't it isn't really a focus on what food choices to make. It's about understanding the relationship between the food you're eating and the amount of insulin you need to take. And so I'm going to sort of slightly step away from that question because I think that that's more of a question about healthy eating and type two diabetes. Which is quite is a sort of a different and much longer conversation. Brilliant, thank you. And um, I'm going to to jump to a, a slightly further on question, which I think follows on from that, that conversation quite nicely. Um, which is, 
why do you think more type ones don't reach the recommended HbA1c target? And I suspect, Dr. Rosenthal, that's from your slide regarding just under 50% yeah. of people being in that target. So I wonder if I can pass that back to you. Yes, because it is extremely hard. Uh, when I spend time with people with living with type 1 diabetes, I'm constantly amazed and impressed by the incredible length that they go to to keep on top of the, all of the multiple things that they need to do to keep their glucose levels into a target range. And I think it's exceptionally hard. Um, I worked with a diabetes nurse who said to me that the problem with type 1 diabetes, it's got to be priority number one, two, three and four. And the thing is, when you've got a three year old crying who won't go to bed and you've got to get up for work the next day, type 1 diabetes can't be at the top of the list. And what I find extraordinary is that people still manage to live their lives and do what they need to do and keep their levels and close to those targets. And so in a way, it's more extraordinary that people can do it. And, and I think that part of the reason is that some people are able to use the technology that is available. They're also able to access it and get hold of it. And it's meaningful to them and it helps. I also think that when we talk about type 1 diabetes, we talk about it being one thing. But I suspect that underneath there, there are some people who have a little bit more pancreas function than other people. And so for some people, it is genuinely slightly more straightforward to give the right amount of insulin for the amount of food they're eating because the pancreas is doing some of the heavy lifting. That's a very small point, but I, I, I suspect that that's there too. Um, and that's why it can become more difficult to manage your diabetes as you go, as you become older. Um, so I think that that's, I think also that healthcare is, is a big part of that. It's about being able to access structured education, um, you know, we know at the moment the Royal Free, we have problems with staffing our educational programme. Actually, appointing staff with the appropriate skills is very difficult to find. Um, and also making those educational programmes um, meaningful and available to people in a way that means that they don't have to take three days off work. So very, very difficult and challenging things. Also, you know, when you have depression or mental health problems, it becomes very, very difficult to manage the, the myriad of of um, instructions and skills that you need to follow to manage your diabetes. So um, I think it is it's it is in a way uh, it, it, not that surprising. There are things coming such as uh, sensors and pumps that speak to each other that will help to move more people into the target range, but they are not without their own um, requirements from the way that you interact with that technology to make it work. So it's not plug in and play. So again, it's really just another piece of what we have in our armory to support people with type 1 diabetes, but is unlikely to deliver everybody to where they need to be. Fantastic. Thank you. Clearly a very complex and thorny and multifactorial um, challenge to get on top of. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, why is diabetes more prevalent in certain ethnic groups such as Asians? Would anyone like to to volunteer to answer that one? I can I can take that. So so again, I, I think like the diet question, this is more relevant to type two diabetes. So it's uh, type two diabetes definitely more common in South Asians than in white Caucasians. In type one diabetes, if anything, it's slightly less common than in white Caucasians. Um, and why is it? It's probably a mixture of genes and environment, uh, really. Remember, the genes for type 1 diabetes are all immune genes, the sort of genes that control T cells that uh, Lucy was talking about. The genes for type 2 diabetes are genes related to the beta cells, so genes that prevent beta cells working so well. So they're very different genes, but they both do tend to travel in families. There's often more of a family history in type 2 diabetes than in type 1 diabetes. Um, and in the context of type 1 diabetes and ethnicity, so, you know, there are certain races that are much more prone to type 1, such as uh, the Finns, Finland has, you know, and the Scandinavian countries have very high rates of type 1 diabetes, uh, much high, higher than that than us, and part of that might be genetic as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So uh, we are at five minutes to seven. So it falls to me to say a huge thank you 
on behalf of all the members and the Council of Governors for Royal Free London for to our speakers. Uh, I think you will all agree uh, an incredibly um, uh, expert, uh, an incredible uh, wide variety and, and expertise um, from our speakers. I'm really grateful to you all for, for giving up an hour this evening to talk to us. So thank you so much. And thank you to all the attendees um, for joining us this evening. Um, if we did not uh, get round to your question, um, please do email us. You can see the email address on the screen there and we can do our best to pick those up afterwards for you. We will also be sending around a link to the recording of tonight's event um, uh, for anybody who may have had any technical difficulties um, during this hour. And finally, um, if there are any queries, concerns, questions for your Council of Governors, um, you can see our email address on the screen there as well. Please do get in touch. But um, just once again, thank you all so much. Thank you to our speakers and have a fantastic evening.